Hi everyone and uh, welcome to our panel today and happy International Women's Day. Um, and as we begin, I wanted to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today. For me, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and I want to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today and to First Nations people around the world, including from our Pacific neighbours. Um, and on International Women's Day, I wanted to acknowledge the really powerful role that First Nations women have been playing in tackling the climate crisis in so many ways, whether that's women from the Pacific who have been shining a light on this issue for many, many years and putting forward just how severe it is, but also to um, women that I've spoken to about traditional burning practices, for instance, in how we uh, better adapt to the uh, ravages of climate change in our environment. Um, First Nations women are playing a really critical role. So my name's Amanda McKenzie. I'm the CEO and founder of the Climate Council and um, I'll be facilitating today's session. And we'll be talking about climate change and women. And as you know, International Women's Day is a day to celebrate the achievements of women, but probably even more importantly, it's an opportunity to shine a light on where there remains inequality, where there is an opportunity to call for greater action. And it's a critical time when gender equality persists and it can be seen around the world and here in Australia, in social, in economic, in cultural and political environments. Um, and it's one of the most pressing issues for our society. So I wanted to acknowledge that in terms of climate change, because of course that's a magnifier. Um, climate change affects those who are oppressed or marginalised, generally the worst. Those who are most vulnerable suffer the most when there are extreme weather events, for instance, and women are particularly and disproportionately affected by climate change and its impacts, which are felt most keenly in developing countries um, and vulnerable communities. But on the flip side of this, as I already mentioned, women are leading the world's climate action in such a variety of ways, demanding more from world leaders, fighting to protect their communities. So in today's session, what we wanted to do is shine a light on some of um, the inspiring women who are leading and take the spotlight to some of those organisations who are on the front line of the climate crisis. So what I'm going to do first is go to each of our speakers and ask them to introduce themselves a little bit and tell us about um, how they're showing up to um, take on this challenge. And then we'll go into a bunch of questions as well. So please feel free to firstly, um, tell us where you're coming from um, in the chat, but then also put in your questions so I can see if we can get to as many as possible. So on that note, I'd like to throw to Kavita Nadu, an international human rights lawyer specializing in feminist climate advocacy and movement building from Fiji. So Kavita, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and what it means to you to be a woman campaigning for climate action and feminist climate demands? Thank you, Amanda, and happy International Women's Day, everyone. I would also like to acknowledge that I'm uh, standing on stolen land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to pay tribute to the work of all Aborigines, Aborigine and Torres Strait Islander peoples Iwi Māori and Pacific Islanders fighting for climate justice to protect their country. So me, it's, I, I have multiple identities. I am a Pacific Islander, but I have Indian heritage. And so growing up and for generations, my people um, who are most recently known as Fijians of Indian descent have faced various discrimination and racism growing up in the Pacific Islands. Now I live in Australia and I call Australia home um, and I'm a woman of colour in Australia and now I'm dealing with white privilege and sexism and very colonial and pa patriarchal systems of governance, our political, economic and social institutions um, are very much influenced in a colonial patriarchal um, way. And so for me to start working in feminist climate advocacy, I think started at a very young age because we've lived through the climate impacts um, growing up in, in Fiji. And, you know, I fully empathize with the people across New South Wales and Queensland right now going through these floods because I've also lost my home um, 
had property damaged and had to relocate because of flooding when I was growing up in Fiji. And initially I was only doing traditional human rights work where all my work was about the violations committed by the state. But then in 2015, everything changed because Cyclone Winston hit Fiji and I was living in Australia, but I felt such a profound sense of grief about what happened, I moved back. And that's when I decided that I'm going to start working in climate advocacy. And I work in feminist climate advocacy. And so I work with grassroots women in Asia and the Pacific. And these women are at the forefront of suffering the most disproportionate impacts of climate injustices. And yet they are at the forefront of also fighting for climate justice in their communities across this nation. So they give me a lot of strength, power, and commitment to stand tall with them and fight with them. Great, thank you. That's, um, that was a really deep insight into where you come, come from on this. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Joe Dodds, who's the president of Bushfires for Climate Action. Um, Joe, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and um, why you're leading Bushfires for Climate Action, um, uh, why you've been part of starting that organisation and what it means to you to be working on um, climate change? Yeah, thanks, Amanda. So we started Bushfire Survivors Climate Action in late 2018, early 2019, after the Tathra district fire, um, which was a fire that, that impacted my property, but I didn't lose my home. Um, and, and that's one of the fine points I'm always keen to stress is it's the impact of bushfires, like any climate um, disasters, is not necessarily that you lose your home. There's a whole range of things that can happen that in, in my case, it was about losing a landscape that was my place. That was where I lived, was in this wider environment. And, and that was so damaged by the fire that, that ended up on my property that I would get lost driving home afterwards. So... It, um, witnessing firsthand that level of destruction and and watching my neighbors and friends who did actually lose their homes on top of the whole um, landscape around them was such a pivotal moment for me of realizing that the climate disaster was not a future problem it was very much here and now and for me i'd already been active in the climate space for what probably a decade or more by then but i hadn't really viscerally understood what it meant and that it wasn't something that was going to impact you know I, I don't have kids but you know I've got nieces and nephews and I've got um, family that I don't want to see having to live through these disasters but I always pictured that being generations after me it, it suddenly I understood that it was right now but also that the in this moment right now we had the power to actually change that future and it was going to require a lot of people uh, stepping up, stepping into uncomfortable places. For me, that was becoming much more of a public figure and taking a lot of responsibility for campaigning and meeting with MPs and things that I'd never done before in my life. So it was it, it just stepping into that or out of the comfort zone. Not that the comfort zone was very comfortable at that point because it looked like bushfires and, and mayhem. So I guess I was pushed into the role and I'm, I will be forever grateful for the fact that I experienced something that, that, that pushed me forward into a bigger life and a much more important um, work for the rest of my life than I had been doing up till then. So that's why I'm doing this now and I find incredible satisfaction in working in this space and the camaraderie of good people around me who, who are are building a culture of cooperation and collaboration to deal with this problem. So we're not using the old frameworks to try and solve this, this global problem. We're, we're actually creating a, a different world that's based on principles of collaboration that, and, and so much of it derives from feminism and it's much more inclusive. So I, I, I'm just thrilled to be here in this space, even though it's for such tragic and awful reasons. So many, you know, I, I see so many people suffering so much yet there's so much opportunity. So that's why I'm here. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. That was a really powerful introduction. Um, and 
I think as I've um, got to know so many women um, working on this issue, uh, often the inspiration has come from exactly that experiences that perhaps I'd look back on thinking that was actually horrible, the thing that happened that kind of got me into this, but then um, find a great deal of satisfaction with working with other people that really um, get how bad it is and how important it is to do as much as possible. Um, so I also wanted to welcome um, Lisa Villamu Jamison, a Samoan Australian community campaigner and creative producer. Um, Lisa, considering your work for the Brisbane Pacific Climate Warriors and in solidarity with Torres Strait Islanders on the Our Island, Our Home campaign, what does it mean to you to be a woman campaigning on climate action in those communities? Thank you, Amanda. Um, firstly, just want to acknowledge country. So I'm calling in from the engine here on Yagara country. I want to pay my respects with two traditional owners, the ancestors, then the NC skies, the totems, um, and their law. And I um, yeah, also want to pay my respects to their matriarchs and their women. So um, in answer to your question, um, what it means to do work in the climate space uh, is, is so meaningful, meaningful for me in terms of purpose. So uh, like you mentioned, I'm a Tuma'ita Islamo woman. So uh, my family comes from Samoa, uh, but I have a lot of family spread out across the Pacific. I grew up in Australia. Um, and in 2015, I remember seeing Pacific Islanders come over and block the world's largest coal port in Newcastle. Uh, with traditional canoes. And I remember thinking to myself, um, this is so moving, this is powerful. It was the Pacific Climate Warriors. And um, I thought we shouldn't have Pacifica people traveling to Australia to do this work. Uh, I, as someone living in the diaspora, should be showing solidarity. I should be using, using my privilege. Um, I shouldn't be seeing people coming here and getting arrested uh, because of the inaction of my government. So uh, for me, a lot of my work is about solidarity work. Uh, it's not about, I don't experience climate change on a personal level the way that my family and um, communities back in the Pacific do, uh, but I have, I feel a responsibility to show up for um, them, you know, and, and amplify what they're saying. Um, and in, say, in, in, in this journey, sorry, I'm stuttering because I'm a little bit nervous, um, and I was telling the ladies before this that I, I'm eight months pregnant, so my heart is like beating, my baby's kicking, but uh, it's important for me to show up in spaces like this because if I don't, um, you know, it's an opportunity lost. And where I can, I try to um, pass the mic. Uh, but I also realised as someone living here that I'm a settler uh, and that I need to be showing solidarity for First Nations women too. So. Um, through my work with Our Islands, Our Home, I'm working with traditional owners and, and women um, and elders up in the Torres Strait. And, uh, you know, it's very meaning, meaningful for me. I can't, exp can't express how much working with these communities gives me um, absolute purpose in my life. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you, Lisa. Um, as people in the chat have just said, you're doing amazing and um it's really powerful to hear your story and also know that you have a, another little being that's contributing um, to this conversation as well and gives us all that sense of perspective of how important this, this work is, um, not just for people who are um, in, alive now, but will be uh, um, you know, existing probably within into the next century potentially. Um, Kavita, given your experience in this area, can you talk about what the link is between climate change and gender and what that the impact of climate change is on women and girls um, here and around the world? Sure. So I think I'll take you on a little history lesson because it always helps to put things in context. So we generally see, you know, disproportionate impacts of climate change on women from the global south or developing countries, women from Africa, Latin America, Asia, Pacific Islands. And the reason these women are vulnerable is because legacies of colonialism, genocide and slavery have made these women vulnerable. And that's reinforced in patriarchal conservative communities across the region as well. And 
To add to that is our global neoliberal agenda of making profit. So women's unpaid care and labor from these developing countries in fact sustains the global economy. Oxfam's data shared that women's unpaid labor, they put 12.5 billion hours each and every day, amounts to almost $11 trillion, um, for which they receive no benefits. That, that's three times the size of the global tech industry, just to put in context how wealth inequality looks like in this world. So women and girls still make up the world's most poor, the world's most hungry, and the pandemic has pushed those numbers even higher. And it's the same even in developed countries where women and girls are still fighting for equal gender pay to be recognized in sports, um, women holding senior positions in the corporate sector, private sector, media, entertainment, inequality exists because we live in an unequal world. And that's because injustices are driven by patriarchal systems that deliberately subjugates women so that they're unpaid care and labor, but also to ensure that um, sorry, I'm being distracted by the chat. I'll stop looking at the chat. But but also, so women are, are put in a position where they don't have equal access to their basic and fundamental human rights. So education, food, water, secure housing, secure employment. And so when the impacts of climate change um, happen all around the world, women are disproportionately impacted because, and there's so much data around this, where women and children face higher mortality rates because of national disasters, where women in most parts of the world do not own or their, their, their lands. Um, so when the lands are being destroyed, whether through national disasters or droughts or floods, these women don't even have basic tenure rights to actually claim that they've lost something. So the, the levels of intersectional discrimination inequality for women, um, and this is also very true for indigenous Australian women, when you know these women suffer the impacts of bushfires and floods and cyclones, is they've already been uh, discriminated and having such li limited rights so for them to actually adapt and be resilient to climate impacts is really, really very low. But in saying that, the agency of the same women is not being recognized as it should. These women are traditional holders and resource managers of their land, the natural environment. They know how to care for their communities. They have so much knowledge. And yet the agency of these women are simply not tabbed, which is, the part the work that I do in feminist participatory action research is mobilizing grassroots women using the solutions that they themselves come up with to really fight against these oppressive systems of patriarchy. Thank you, Kavita. That was that was very um, very powerful. And uh, Lisa, I'm I'm wondering, Kavita's given us this sort of outline of some of the systemic drivers of inequality and how that's then exacerbated by the climate crisis. Um, your experience in working with the Torres Strait um, climate justice case, our islands, our home, I'm wondering if you can talk to how you're seeing the impact of those systemic drivers um, in terms of women's lived experience in the communities you work with. Sure thing, Amanda. Um, I can't speak on behalf of these women, um, but I'll share what I've observed is that um, yeah, basically, like Kavita was sharing, you know, you have these pillars and systems of oppression, uh, white supremacy, capitalism, uh, the patriarchy, and these are all the pillars that, um, you know, Indigenous women and uh, women of colour have to face. And I, I've noticed um, that, you know, whilst in the Torres Strait, so to give you context of some of the islands that I'm working with, how small they are, uh, Masik is 2.8 kilometres long and 800 metres wide. So when we talk about uh, rising sea levels and metres being taken away, like that, that's a lot of, um, that means a lot to people there. It's, um, you know, it's a, a situation where they could be forced to have to move. 
Um, and I'm working with women like Auntie Nazareth, who uh, are traditional owners and matriarchs and, and hold cultural authority to represent their community and, um, you know, are taking the Australian government to the United Nations over um, their inaction with climate change. At the same time, they're having to deal with uh, issues with access to, um, you know, healthcare and, and juggling cultural responsibilities and um, supporting family and um, navigating all these different things. So um, I guess, yeah, there are a lot, a lot of struggles, but what, what I really want to frame is that um, these women are super resilient. These women, um, you know, they, I learned so much from them. They're like, uh, innovative. Um, I, I can't stress enough how much I've seen in the climate movement over the years. Um, our women being like framed in a way that they're victims alone. Um, I want to just flip that and just say uh, they're absolute powerhouses. And, you know, I've seen women. Um, sorry, I'm like on the biggest tangent. Um, but I, I just want to yeah, reiterate that uh, what Kavita was saying to that um, these women are, are doing amazing things on the ground and they are uh, navigating so much while um, taking on the Australian government. So, mm. no, I think it's an absolutely um, important point, um, Lisa, that that narrative of um, switching from being sort of a victim narrative that these things are happening to these people versus you know, also that empowerment narrative of people are taking action into their own hands and against all, all odds in um, many ways. And as you said, with um, a vast array of other responsibilities. Um, jo, I was, wanted you to reflect on that as well, that um, you've been through three bushfire crises, um, how you've seen um, uh, the impact on women in your communities. Was it disproportionate? How has that um how has that manifested? But then also the leadership you've seen from women. So going to um, Lisa's dichotomy, if you like, like what has been the impact on women, but also how have you seen women react and um, take leadership? Yeah, thanks, Amanda. And yeah, a very, um, very instructive to have been, for me, to have been through that process after the Tartar fire. So um, and, and sitting in the background watching how one community responded to that disaster and and if if people aren't familiar with that fire it, it went straight through this very small um little seaside village of tarthra it's got i don't know 400 kind of permanent residents and we lost 69 homes so the fire just cut straight through the center of town right to the ocean so it, a community in great shock um a, a pretty cohesive community um and then watching that response afterwards was very informative because what started to happen was um, the people who thought of themselves as the, the traditional leaders in community. So there were the formal leaders, which was council, um, you know, some state government bods were thrown in to help guide. And, and, and some of those were women um, in both roles, but that was a kind of bureau bureaucratic system stepping in, which are helpful to a point. But I, I know from so much research that's been done on recovery that it, if it's not community led, it invariably goes off down pathways that are not the, the ones that community most need. So it does need to be very focused on what the community identifies as their goals and their needs and, and their processes for, for moving in, into a, you know, a, a healthier future. So one of the things that happened was that within community, people who had leadership roles, maybe from local sports clubs or um, you know, the, the, the local community orgs, like uh, trying to think of the names of them, the Progress Clubs and Rotary, those kind of clubs were, and invariably they were men, and they were the ones who were stepping straight up in these positions and starting to suggest this is the direction we're going and these are the things that we want and we need. And it became very focused on the, the repair and recovery of the things and what I noticed was there was this whole cohort of people sitting further back in the room or more quietly in the room at these big community meetings that were happening um, several times a week in the beginning. And it was women. And it was women sitting back waiting for a time to be asked or waiting for the appropriate time to say something and second guessing themselves 
while they watched the men grab the 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 you know the grab the steering wheel and take recovery in a particular direction and what happened was that very quietly i i started expressing my discomfort with what i was seeing and finding that there many other people were sitting quietly in the back of the room where i was also going this is not what i want from recovery i'm more concerned about the people and how we're feeling and and the impact on us in terms of the the long long term the impact on people who've already been through traumas or have got current issues going on on mental health um and how that plays out in the long term and that was at, at times very um there was a great tension between those two things and and the fact that the the repair of this concrete world seemed to be the be be all and end all for a while until women did start to step into that space and say now hang on a minute we're there we want more than that we want we want that, yes, but we also want to be very much included in the decision making. And there are certain aspects of this that we want to take leadership on. And it won't necessarily be via these big groups that are, you know, already in existence. They'll, and so ultimately, through that, and then in the subsequent fires through the um, 2019 and 2020 fires, um, we've seen women in and men across communities in in our region who've risen to those positions of community leadership because they've been more consultative, because they've been more collaborative, and it's a different style of recovery that they're leading. And I think it's more inclusive and I think it's more respectful. And I think it's, well, I know it's more successful as a result because it's, it's a softer approach. And it, and it, because they consider, those leaders consider more fully what the community wants, it's, it, it results in a more, in a much more cohesive community as, as you start to recover and, and rebuild yourselves and your homes and your community. So um, that's what I saw happening. And I think women's skills as negotiators were very important in that, um, which is not to say that men don't have those skills as well, but there seem to be ways of working that women are much more familiar with or that are the feminist ways of working that men work within um, very well as as well so watching those other ways of working become predominant and and not necessarily being re even recognized let alone celebrated but watching them be very effective in my community has been um a great encouragement to me and i'm much more op um, optimistic about the future having seen the power and having seen the success of, of those movements and the longevity. That's the other thing is they're quite sustainable, these, these ways of working because they're inclusive and that they, they mean that you've got to have a team and you've got to have a team that functions well and is supportive of each other. And um, yeah, it, I, it's been a very positive experience. Thanks, Joe. And I think that reflection that there are um, traits that women tend to bring to leadership that can be immensely valuable in recovery from these disasters, but also, um, in advocating for change and again as you've said it's not to say that men cannot have those traits of course they can but it's something that we often see in women's leadership um Kavita I'd love you to reflect on this as well um what aspects um of the way you see women lead are very powerful in um uh, approaching uh this challenge whether it's from an advocacy perspective whether it's mobilizing communities etc um, what do you think are the skills and knowledge that um, women bring that can be really powerful? So, I mean, that's a really difficult question, to be quite honest, because I'm 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 in a country where I, I need to bring in the developed experiences of women, but I would also like to really talk about the the experiences of women that are not generally recognized in our system. So women who are not educated, women who cannot read. Um, and write or speak in English. And um, so I'm probably going to start with them. So what they bring in terms of feminist climate advocacy is a real understanding that there is something vastly wrong if profit is more important than family, care, regeneration, and sustainable use of their natural environment. And the, these women in developing countries recognize this very strongly because 
almost 80%, if not more, of the informal economy is actually made up of women. And this includes your small scale uh, fisher folk. It includes um, female farmers. And so the, because they suffer the impacts where the yields are low, there's not enough fish to catch, um, the water sources and the food sources are drying up. To actually bring their experience of how they're adapting or how they're building resilience into these co conversations is so critical in really developing the right solutions that would work for the community and for everyone. So when we say feminist climate advocacy or climate justice is a feminist issue, it's not just about women talking about solutions that work for women. It's in fact for the entire community. And in Australia, in the developed sense, and, and I'll just rely on this um, article that I'm co-authoring um, uh, with, with another colleague. And we're really just collating data about, you know, gender and its influence within the larger climate policy spaces in Australia. And what we find is that, you know, most of these ministerial portfolios um, are held by men. So whether it's energy, emission, re emissions reduction, water, I think transport, a number of them are held by men. And so the fact that women are excluded or not even not even showing gender parity in this space is deeply troubling. And then as we're collecting this data, we're finding that the key climate policies also do not mention gender. So then you question where women meaningfully consulted, are they participating? Are they leading policy development in, 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 in finding climate solutions or tackling climate crisis in Australia? And so this is why it is so important to bring this up because I feel that generally people don't understand just how unequal the participation of women is at various levels of our society. And the fact that women are not being meaningfully included, whether it's in mitigation, adaptation or resilience is hugely problematic. And so that spaces like this is quite important to bring that information in so that we can all recognize and start ensuring that power is being shared equally and that power for women is being built and that their voices are amplified and heard where it's supposed to, especially when it comes to policy making and actions that the government needs to. Mm. Um, and Kavita, you've talked a bit about um, uh, climate justice and you've made mentioning, um, you know, what is the leadership that can be shown from uh, women in developing countries. I'd love you to articulate for us what climate justice would mean for those women. So I'll give you an example. We worked with a grass, grassroots women in the region and through this feminist participatory action research where we spent about three years with them, which helps them mobilize and become quite strong feminist political activists um, demanding uh, climate justice. You know, one of these women then was voted in as the first women leader of the community. And then she went on to join the parliament. And throughout this, and there's data around this as well, the female political leaders um, at any level are far more attuned and um, a strong advocate for progressive climate policies in their communities, policies that are not simply relying on technology and profit as the solutions. And so that's the kind of leadership we need to balance. And that's what climate justice looks like. So for, for the work that we do, a lot of our, our agenda was a feminist fossil fuel free future. Um, and if, uh, Jane, if you could just share that link, and it talks about, you know, working towards a decolonial, gender just, equitable, sustainable, regenerative, locally owned economy that is grounded in indigenous sovereignty, knowledge, and protects human rights. And that is a completely different and alternative outlook to what our current economy looks like, which is a globalized world that is dependent on hypercapitalism and profit making. So that's how I see 
feminist mm. leadership in the climate justice space really working towards. Mm. And it sounds like it is kind of crafting even that vision as a, what an alternative even looks like. Um, uh, Lisa, it wouldn't be International Women's Day if we weren't taking the opportunity to celebrate women's leadership and spotlight organisations doing meaningful work um, to drive change. Um, I'd love your thoughts on um, what it, people that are inspiring you, women that are inspiring you, um, and who is showing the leadership that you think is so critically needed. Um, I'm just sitting here like super inspired um, by who's on this panel. Like I'm learning so much. So thank you both. I feel like I should be in the audience. <laughs> um, all right. So who's inspiring? inspiring me um first and foremost it's the women I work with on a daily basis so um like I mentioned the traditional owners up in the Torres Strait um Auntie Naz warrior Auntie Naz Sayed um also my team with our islands our home Wanaki and Tisha Perry King uh just dealing with so much um not just the climate crisis but so many other issues and struggles and uh continually showing up um so that those guys, my team, uh, if you want to find out more, ourislandsourhome.com.au. And then uh, my sisters, my, um, you know, my friends that have become family in the engine in Brisbane, are the Queensland Pacific Climate Warriors. I work with just amazing young women, uh, all volunteers. So I'll just name them because I know a few are on call. Mary, Moinga, Irie uh, and Lisa. Uh, they have been volunteering with me for you know, years, uh, mobilising community, um, putting pressure on MPs, uh, organising storytelling events, uh, you know, just working extra jobs and doing this on top of all of their responsibilities. Uh, so, you know, if you want to check out our work, Pacific Climate Warriors Queensland on Instagram, uh, they're actually about to launch um, some beautiful earrings uh, that are raising awareness about climate justice and the earrings were created by uh, another Samoan sister, Talisi, and um, each earring has so much meaning and, um, you know, I love seeing the creativity brought into, um, you know, working for climate justice uh, where we, we're able to tell our stories through art and culture and uh, we're organizing a photo shoot tomorrow actually which I'm really excited about but you know I just want to give a shout out to those women who bring so much joy uh, to this work because it is hard but um you know they provide the inspiration I need on a daily basis and lastly um a random organization that's not climate re related but so water sisters um, they're a surfing organization in Vanuatu that I just am obsessed with. Um, yeah, I just get so inspired seeing their photos, check them out. These young women um, in Vanuatu using surf to empower themselves, surfing, sorry. And I just love that. And hopefully one day I'll be able to do that one day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass it back to you, Amanda. Thanks, Lisa. That was awesome. Um, Joe. I want to bring in a question from the audience here, but also uh, keep touching on this issue of um, celebrating women's leadership. Um, so Noni's asking, um, she says it may be premature, but she'd love to know how jo, jo Dodds is placed to provide modelling directions for support to help set up a flood survivors, survivors for climate action, um, given there's so much anger and frustration in impacted communities. Um, Noni thinks it may be a good time for that sort of community-led um, response. Um, so Joe, I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about your story about how um, one goes about setting up um, an organisation and um, leading it to create um, an effective um, national voice. It's an important celebration in and of itself. Thanks, Amanda. And thanks, Noni, for the question. And I'm tempted to say I have no idea. It just happens. <laughs> but clearly, I've got to this point. So I must have done something. Well, it's been a team effort, absolute team effort for bushfire survivors for climate action to come together. And there, there has been a lot of help and guidance and resources from other organisations who saw people like me and other friends and other members who were speaking out about the link between bushfires and climate 
and speaking out not in the academic sense or, uh, you know, as researchers or as um, politicians, but speaking out as people standing there in the, the ashes um, who were feeling, the, like deeply feeling the stories and the, the, the sorrow and the trauma of what had, what had happened around them. So it, it was a coming together of both that, like when you've been through that, and I know there will be so many people here today on this call who've been through similar events. So um, I want to recognise the lived experience of so many people through all of the, the various traumas of, of climate damage, but also the personal stories and the personal histories of trauma that, that feed into how we deal with these things that are happening at the moment. But I think if you're fortunate, those... The, the the back the backstory to those events and those impacts is that you can be compelled to action and I I think that's been a big part of it is that tapping into the anger and the the frustration was what helped me step through the barriers and the barriers are things like you know not knowing what to do but then also things like thinking I'm not the right person for this job but then going well I'm the person here today, so I'm just going to do it and I'm going to let all the doubt just sit in the background because it's not really helpful for anyone. So that was a big part of it for me. But but then it was the getting down to the nuts and bolts and, and thinking about, well, we do need to form an actual group of some kind and do we become incorporated or not? That was a point where I turned to other people who'd been through this process before. The And it's this is going to sound weird coming from someone who just started an organization, but if you want to be active on climate, the first thing is not to start a new organization, which is what I did. Okay. And I say that because there are so many really well oiled, functional, effective organizations already in this space that it's only when you see a niche that actually does fill an important gap that it's worth building a whole new thing which is kind of what we've done um and to to that question about the floods look that that point's been raised with me so many times in the last couple of weeks about whether we should be changing ourselves to climate disaster um survivors but i guess one of the reasons that we've stuck with bushfire all this time is that the links between bushfire and climate damage um have been proven to be it's extremely strong and extremely obvious what those links are between the two whereas it's not quite as strong or obvious with floods so we've chosen to pick that one topic that um it's an undeniable link between the two now i have no doubt that the floods that are happening at the moment are also the result of climate damage so um you know there's a very legitimate uh, case for people being impacted by any kind of climate disasters to step up and and demand that their voices be heard. Uh, I would say if, if people are interested, they could join as supporters, a group like ours, and become a member, see what we do, attend some training. And then if you decide that there's there is a, another gap and that we need a different group, then you know that becomes a negotiable thing. But in the meantime, I'm I'm really focused on getting into MPs' ears and taking uh, as diverse a, a bunch of community members as I can empower to do this with me or to, to go on their own and have those meetings and make their case and um, insist that communities deserve and demand that they be kept or assisted to be safer from the sort of disasters we're looking at the moment and that the kind of nonsense that we're hearing from politicians, particularly at the federal level, ceases, and they focus instead on the impacts on community and the sort of bickering and and um, I don't know what they the, on Channel Seven on Sunrise program it was called out as BS that we were hearing from a certain um, a certain deputy prime minister. Um, we don't need that right now. We need to focus on the people being impacted, and we need to get on with the job of. Uh, both dealing with the immediacy and with um, making sure that we're working on the problem that sits in the background because it's only going to get worse. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Joan. Um, the, the line that you said that really sticks with me when you were talking about 
setting up um, the organisation is I'm the person here today. I think that's often what is so striking is when you're in this, you know, like, I didn't seek leadership, it was that I'm the person here today. And the next um, questions from Kirsten in the chat, she says, I try um, communicating the urgency of climate change to inspire people to take action, but I feel like we've been saying it's urgent for 15 plus years. How do we keep a sense of urgency up and keep inspiring, motivating ordinary people to take action? And um, your line, Joe, really strikes me as an important answer to that. You know, I'm the person here today. Um, Kavita, I'd love your reflections on that too. How do you keep up this um, sense of urgency and pushing for, for change? I, I relate so strongly to that question. I feel like Leonardo DiCaprio from Don't Look Up on most days. Um, and, and being branded as the hot-tempered, crazy brown woman, um, because I am that angry and frustrated. And as Joe said, you know, we, we really need to focus on the problem, and the problem is climate injustice. But we live in such an unequal world that while we are trying to really, you know, advocate hard and lobby and campaign to make sure we've got the right things coming in to address climate change, in many of these spaces, like I said, I began this panel by saying that right now I'm navigating sexism and white privilege in the spaces that I'm, first of all, I can't even find a paid job in Australia. It's so difficult. Um, and that just tells you, you know, the layers of intersectional discrimination that really works. And at the same time, we have these um, emergencies, you know, these, these colliding crises. And so, at a, at a personal level, when you're really trying to keep everything together and, and be there and, and be in this fight and, and give it your best and put all your energy, what we really need is solidarity. We really need solidarity, community care. We need people with power and privilege to really start using that power and privilege to do the right thing and not be complacent. And this is where, you know, what frustrates me so much is that in Australia, human rights is thought of as an outsourced problem for poor brown people in developing countries. People within Australia, you barely hear human rights being used in connection with climate change. Since I've been here and I speak on climate justice, so for me, climate justice is putting a human face to climate injustices, not technology and not science only, but the human face, the human impacts of the climate crisis. And I think if Australians really start waking up to the human faces, to the faces of the people who are right now living in cars because their homes are flooded with their two-year-old toddlers, or who have tried to rebuild their homes years after years and can no longer pay $28,000 in insurance per year, you know, think about the people in this crisis. And think about how you can stand in solidarity with your local community groups, with your NGOs, and, and including influencing your MPs, right, to really start acting in solidarity and building power so that people who we can help get the help they need. Mm. Uh, yeah, you make some powerful points there. Um, uh, Marcia in the chat is saying, but how do you do it if the Climate Council's tried and failed? How can it be achieved? And um, I get this question a lot, you know, um, which is related to the question Kirsten um, asked as well, like, how do you keep up inspiring people? I think if you look backwards, we have travelled a long way. If you look forwards, we've got a long way to go. So we've got to be, you know, taking the wins where they where they come. But as you're, you're saying, Kavita, you know, there, there is a long way to go and we keep um, that sort of frustration and dissatisfaction, I suppose, is a big driver um, and is it continuing um, to push us push us forward um, and it's very hard when you've got like this compelling big vision and that you've got you know it's the top of the mountain and each time you look you it seems like you're at the bottom even though maybe you traversed quite a way to get there already um, I, I wanted to continue in this sort of um, theme around how do we um, continue to motivate ourselves and keep that um, urgency ticking in our in our hearts if you like um, but also to think about how we tap into nurturing our own well-being during those times, um, because obviously it's um, if you look around at the news right now, it's pretty heavy seeing 
um, what's going on in the Ukraine, to the floods, to so many other um, issues. Um, Lisa, I thought I'd start with you. Um, what tools do you do? Do you use to nurture your own well-being, and how do you encourage those that you work with to support theirs? Such a good question, because I particularly was feeling overwhelmed last week um, being in Brisbane um, seeing all the floods and so many people impacted um, I think for me I just do what I can in my corner and um, you know I, I think of I'm inspired by the women I work with you know um, I, I take a lot of time for grounding myself in my own culture. That's ultimately what I also want to protect. Um, you know, I want to be able to move back home. I want my son to be able to see and experience the coral reef that I grew up experiencing. So I think of the, my loved ones, my family, um, you know, and uh, those, you, yeah, basically try to humanize this climate crisis. And, you know, today I really was like, oh, I don't want to do this panel. I'm like so anxious and baby, like making me feel sick. But I, I'm like, no, you know, we've got to show up every day. And um, before I joined, I listened to some, some grounding music to help me um, ground myself in culture and remind me. And I think for me, just trying to take it a day at a time um, and also think of those who don't have the opportunities that I have um, that I need to like, you know, get on with it. <laughs> Look mm -hmm. after yourself, but also get on with it. Um, but yeah. Hopefully that adds something <laughs> to the point. Yeah, no, it's so important, isn't it? Like that um, so many women, um, including myself, show up with this sense of the sort of imposter syndrome, like, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to put myself outside our comfort zone. And I'm sure we can all relate to that thing of, um, the bravery that you're describing, um, Lisa, where you're like, I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway because I understand why important, how important it is and why it aligns so deeply with my values. And I think that's the conversation I have with myself um, each time I do something that's outside of my comfort zone, which working on climate change, I feel like you're um, often <laughs> outside of your comfort zone. I think particularly for women, like I grew up as really a people pleaser and didn't want to rock the boat like that's not my natural thing want to be like I'm often you know the smoother in the in the group but then you've got to speak truth to power that's the obligation in in this role so one of the more uncomfortable things I did was um saying bullshit on tv describing one of Scott Morrison's speeches <laughs> and I had to get a media advisor to coach me through I'm like so can we just practice saying bullshit a few times because it's not something I like really know how to do <laughs> So thank you for that, um, those thoughts, um, Lisa. I wanted to bring that to you, Joe, as well. How do you keep motivated, particularly with all the, the bad news? I say bullshit a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I'm the opposite to you, Amanda. Maybe we need to team up because I'm the, I'm the one who's going to go there and actually shirt front some of those people. And I have done and I have called them out on stuff and sometimes a little bit um, unstrategically, shall we say. But, yeah, I think two of my practices to get through a lot of what I do are rage and caffeine but um, in between no I've learned I'm I'm I guess I'm you know I've been doing this for a few years now and five and a half years on local government that was a big wake-up call as well and I've learned to to find a middle path through that to use use the anger and the discomfort to motivate me to do things but to I feel like now I have found a place where I know that what I'm doing is impactful. And I would say whoever's listening who is still frustrated with what, what you see as a lack of action, join a group like Bushfire Survivors and start digging deeper into what works strategically because that was so important for me was to learn that simply running out into the world and shouting about what was annoying me or you know lying on a road and blocking traffic, it makes you feel good in the moment because you're getting your rage out. But in terms of it actually turning the thing around, I feel like what I do now, including when I don't say bullshit, is the thing that's actually making a difference. And that helps me sleep at night in ways I haven't slept for a long time. So that and crochet, that's the other thing. Having a, <laughs> it seems funny, but a handcraft to do in the evenings where I just chill, I'm obsessed with it, I'm crocheting. If anyone wants 
the best kitchen sponges in the world. I'm making them at the moment. But it's finding that balance between the really heavy duty focus and busyness of this space, using the impetus of, of people's lived experience and never forgetting that stuff and then just using that that push of 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 um fire and it gives me courage and it gives me energy and it gives me you know the sense of injustice seeing what happens to other people around me and beyond my scope and and wanting to give them more scope for raising their voices is what keeps me going every time I feel flat or I feel like I'm not the person so that's how I do it and you know we can all do the same thing because we've all got that in us so find we we find our path I love that thank you Joe. um we're coming to the end of the panel so I just wanted to go to each of you for a final thought just very brief um sentence or so on um your message to this audience today on International Women's Day how do you want them to go away thinking about the issues of climate and gender and with an election coming up, what they should be, um, what they should be going away thinking about. Um, I'll start with you, Kavita. Another hard one. I think in Australia, the main thing is for people to really start changing their attitudes about climate injustice and not just believe everything that you hear from corporations, Murdoch Media and government. You know, read the stuff that Climate Council produces, read the stuff that Indigenous activists produce. Um, listen to the stories about people who are experiencing the worst impact of climate um, injustice and truly recognize the power and privilege you hold because it's the same as what Joe and Lisa have said. Things are really hard. Like the, the burnout rate for climate activists is massive. Um, and every day, you know, we, we have to find a way to keep going. And, but the more we find allies, the more power we start building among ourselves, whether it starts from your family, your schools, your work, um, it all builds power if it starts shifting and changing attitudes and you can start making really informed political, economic and social choices that center human rights, indigenous sovereignty in this country that really challenge the colonialism, patriarchy and white privilege in this country, because that is the systemic problem that's driving the climate crisis in this country. So let's just start by trying to change our attitudes to how we look at this. Thank you. Lisa, a final thought from you? Oh, love it. Uh, for me, I think it's really hard to pour into others if your your cup's not full itself so i think uh today i just want to encourage women to you know be, be selfish set boundaries um and take it a day at a time but um yeah also i think you know when we talk about indigenous women and how climate change is impacting them try see the try see their stories beyond just you know impacts and and learn about their culture, um, you know, support where you can. Um, I'm on the biggest tangents because of brain, baby babe, brain. But yeah, do what Jay said, do some crochet, do things that bring you joy. For me, um, I was motivated by rage a lot. And um, I also think joy is a powerful incentive to, to protect what you love. So mm. that's my final thought. Thanks, Lisa. That's beautiful. Um, Joe, a final thought from you? Just get involved, people. Um, this is going to be a long battle, so we we need we need to refresh those those troops. And I think uh, uh, nothing makes me happier than seeing the number of young women in this movement who are leading it, who are learning um, skills. I'll I don't have time to learn, so um, I think the, there there is I have so much hope for the future that I didn't have before. The deeper I go into this, the more hopeful I am, and the more I'm I'm basing that hope in really solid. Uh, practice and, and observation. So I'm not just being a fantasist. I think we've got a really good crack at turning this around, uh, but it, it needs everyone getting on board. So get out there, get amongst it. 
Thank you. And thank you to all of our panellists. I think it's been a fantastic conversation. I come away feeling really inspired and I feel like if we were all together in a room, we'd do, um, there'd be a huge applause and people would be on their feet trying to get each of you to have conversations about what they do, what they do next. Um, and to get more insights from each of you, I could talk to you each about this for quite a lot of time. Um, I wanted to thank the team at the Climate Council for putting this on. Um, and for those generous donors who keep us funded, we don't get any government funding. We're absolutely independent and um, we're funded by donations from people like you. So if you love what we do, please um, support us. And I wanted to end with a quote because at the Climate Council, we absolutely believe the best antidote to anxiety is action. And uh, Rebecca Solnit um, says, hope is not a lottery ticket. You can sit on the sofa and clutch feeling lucky. It's an ax. You break down doors with it in an emergency. Hope should shove you out the door because it will take everything you have to steer the future away from endless war, from the annihilation of the earth's treasures and the grinding down of the poor and marginal. I love this idea that it's not a lot of critique. We've each got our hope as an ax that we say, right, we're going to break down the doors of um, the, the parliament and say, you've got to take greater action. And women, we can work together. Um, we can inspire each other. We can make sure that we, um, we're we being bolder and courageous and we don't get um, pulled back by the, um, the centuries of oppression that have made even people like me think, you know, oh, I'll hold back because I want to be a people pleaser. We've got to get out there and um, make sure our voices are heard as loudly as possible and that we are, as um, has been really clearly articulated in this panel, very um, cognizant of the way in which this um, has multiple different dimensions as um, Kavita's really articulated in terms of intersectionality. Um, so I'll leave us there. There's much more that we could say, but thank you for joining us. It's been a fantastic panel and thank you everyone for being involved.